country covering those stories and much more for us tonight but we do begin with yet another mass shooting in america and it comes just one year after the massacre that left 10 dead after a racially motivated mass shooting in buffalo new york we take you back to that community which is still trying to rebuild one year later but first the cycle of gun violence only exacerbated today by what happened in farmington new mexico at least three people have died and two officers were injured after confronting and killing the gunman a call about an active shooter went out around a 11 a.m. local time. Nearby homes and cars were reportedly struck by gunfire during the confrontation in this residential neighborhood, while local schools were placed on lockdown for two hours. According to the Gun Violence Archive, this marks the 225th mass shooting in the U.S. so far this year. Authorities are still searching for a possible motive at this hour. ABC's Kana Whitworth leads us off. Tonight, the urgent investigation into a mass shooting in Farmington, New Mexico, that left at least three people dead and two police officers wounded. The alleged gunman also killed. There are multiple shots still going off in the background on our open lines. Authorities from multiple agencies responding to reports of an active shooter northwest of Albuquerque around 11 a.m. Be advised, I got several people down. Schools citywide put on lockdown as police search for the shooter. I have eyes on the suspect. He's walking south. Officers confronting and killing the suspect, who has not been identified. The two injured officers now in stable condition at the hospital. Multiple homes and vehicles reportedly hit by gunfire. Witnesses describing the horror. I'm in my garage and I hear this rap, 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 rap. And tonight, New Mexico's governor saying in part, I am deeply upset by the tragic violence that unfolded today in Farmington, adding my administration will not stop fighting the epidemic of gun violence from every angle possible. So far this year, there have been at least 225 mass shootings in the United States, according to the Gun Violence Archive. That number just continues to surge. Kana Whitworth joins us now. Kana, you just learned more information about the injured and also the gunman? Right, so just moments ago, Lindsay, authorities saying that in addition to those two officers that were injured, seven other people were also injured. Authorities also saying that this suspect, which they believe is the only suspect here, is 18 years old. Also, all the schools that were on lockdown are now open. That lockdown has been lifted. But also, Lindsay, the FBI says they are standing by. They are ready to assist here if need be. The suspect just 18 years old. Kena Whitworth, our thanks to you. Now to the other big story playing out tonight after a man carried out a violent attack at the office of Virginia Congressman Jerry Connolly. The assailant showed up with a metal baseball bat, asked for the congressman, and then assaulted two of Connolly's staff members as others ran to hide. One of the two staffers, an intern, marking her first day on the job. It's all part of an alarming trend of violence on the nation's elected officials, with threats against lawmakers now increasing 400% in just the last six years. Janae Norman has more on this attack. Tonight, the targeted attack at a congressman's office. You could absolutely tell that the people inside were scared. They were hiding. Two staffers for Virginia Democratic Representative Jerry Connolly rushed to the hospital after police say a man walked into his Fairfax, Virginia district office and attacked them with a metal baseball bat. Someone swinging a bat around, I mean, I would be scared as well. The alleged attacker, identified as 49-year-old Schwan Katron Pham, Connolly's office, telling ABC News he hit a senior aide in the head and an intern in the upper body. Police say the suspect asked for the congressman by name, but Connolly was at a ribbon cutting for a food bank in his district at the time. What is it you're trying to protect? Connolly, a Democrat who serves on the House Foreign Affairs and House Oversight Committees, writing, my district office staff make themselves available to constituents and members of the public every day. The thought that someone would take advantage of my staff's accessibility to commit an act of violence is unconscionable and devastating. Well, indeed, tonight there is no word on a motive, but authorities say they are looking into mental illness as a potential factor. And as for that intern who was injured, Lindsay, we're told it was their first day on the job. Just unbelievable. Janae, our thanks to you. Next tonight, the final report of the special counsel investigating the origins of the FBI's probe into the Trump campaign's possible ties to Russia. After a four-year investigation, finding the FBI never should have launched the Trump-Russia probe in the first place. Here's ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas. 
Tonight, the end of a long road for special counsel John Durham, who was appointed by Donald Trump's Attorney General Bill Barr four years ago to dig into the origins of the FBI's Russia investigation into Trump and his campaign. The Biden administration left Durham in place to complete his work, and in his final report, he slams the FBI indicating they never should have launched a probe in the first place, since neither U.S. law enforcement nor the intelligence community appears to have possessed any actual evidence of collusion. Instead, Durham found that the Bureau relied on raw, unanalyzed, and uncorroborated intelligence, noting that there was significant reliance on investigative leads provided or funded directly or indirectly by Trump's political opponents. An example, the so-called Steele dossier, of allegations prepared by former British spy Christopher Steele. Durham found the FBI was unable to corroborate a single substantive allegation from the dossier. But Trump's own comments about Russia in the campaign added to questions about possible collusion. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. Durham found the FBI failed to critically analyze information that ran counter to the narrative of a Trump-Russia collusive relationship, calling that extremely troublesome. But Durham's investigation, which cost taxpayers $6.5 million, falls far short of proving there was a deep state conspiracy against Trump. The special counsel brought no charges against any senior intelligence or law enforcement officials, and the two major cases he did pursue both ended in acquittals. Durham only convicted one lower-level FBI official of misconduct in pursuing an electronic surveillance warrant. Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, has the FBI responded to the special counsel's report? Well, Lindsay, the special counsel's blistering assessment of the FBI tracks closely with a 2019 highly critical report from the DOJ Inspector General. Tonight, the FBI says it already has put in place dozens of corrective actions that might have prevented those mistakes that were made. Lindsay. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. And staying in Washington now, where time is running out on the debt ceiling standoff that could have a global ripple effect. President Biden and congressional leaders are set to meet tomorrow before the president leaves for a G7 summit on Wednesday. The president is expressing some optimism, but House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says they're still far apart in talks. ABC's senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest. Tonight, with time running out, President Biden is summoning top congressional leaders back to the White House. What day? Over the weekend, the president insisting progress has been made. I really think there's a desire on their part as well as ours to reach agreement. I think we'll be able to do it. But today, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy tells me they are nowhere near a deal. It's just staff moving ideas back and forth, but there's no movement. Are you confident that it'll happen by the end of the week, Speaker McCarthy? Not based upon what they're offering right now, no. McCarthy says he will not raise the debt limit unless the president agrees to spending cuts. Sources say on the table, clawing back unspent COVID funds, streamlining regulations for new energy projects, and imposing stricter work requirements for certain federal aid programs. The consequences of a default would be dire. Social security payments would halt. Troops could go unpaid. And by one projection, nearly 8 million people could lose their jobs. Default is not an option. Its consequences are too damaging, too severe. It must, must be taken off the table. Both sides seemingly trying to avert a potential crisis. Rachel Scott joins us now from Capitol Hill. Rachel, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen once again sounding the alarm on the potential deadline for default. What's her latest warning? Well, Lindsay, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is making it clear that even waiting into the last minute to raise the debt limit could disrupt financial markets and could also downgrade the credit rating for the United States. The closer that we get to default, the worse all of this gets, which is why tonight she is urging Congress to move quickly, Lindsay. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you as always. To the border, after Title 42 expired Thursday night and new rules kicked in, Biden administration officials say the expected surge didn't happen and that the number of people seeking entry has been cut in half. But thousands have gathered on the Mexican side of the border and many more are on the way. ABC's Will Carr is at a processing center in Brownsville, Texas. Tonight, a significant drop in encounters at the border from over 10,000 per day just before Title 42 expired to around 4,200 on Saturday. New rules require non-Mexican migrants to have been denied asylum in another country or apply for an interview through an app. If they don't, they could be deported and barred from entering the U.S. for five years. The 
message that there are consequences in place at the border is an important one that we hope is resonating. In cities at the border and around the country are already at a breaking point. New York City receiving hundreds of asylum seekers every day. More than 4,200 last week alone, reopening the iconic Roosevelt Hotel as an arrival center. I crossed into Mexico to see the conditions at a massive border camp with more than 1,500 migrants in Matamoros. There are quite literally piles of garbage here. You can smell it. There's smoke in the air. They're burning. They're cooking. They're doing everything they can to uh, try to sustain themselves. Many migrants tell me they're trying to use the CBP app but have run into glitches or are having trouble with service. Still, this woman fleeing violence from Honduras, walking the majority of the way to the border, says she's willing to wait. Will Carr joins us now. Will, what are authorities saying about the number of migrants trying to cross the border? Lindsay, federal authorities say there's been a 50% drop over the last three days. They say hundreds of migrants have been turned back to Mexico and thousands more are in custody going through asylum interviews right now. They say that if there still is a surge, they'll be ready in the coming days and weeks. Lindsay. All right. Will Carforce. Thanks so much, Will. Ukraine's deputy defense minister says Ukrainian soldiers continue to gain ground in the battle for Bakhmut. Meanwhile, President Zelensky met with British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak today, his last stop on a diplomatic tour of Europe, gaining new weapons and support. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge is on the ground for us in Ukraine. Tonight, the most significant advance for Ukraine in six months. Dramatic drone video showing Ukrainian forces storming Russian positions near Bakhmut, taking land to the north and south. <sighs> Ukrainian troops lobbing grenades to clear trenches, capturing Russian soldiers. Today, President Zelensky suggesting the gains near Bakhmut are not the beginning of a major counteroffensive, saying on a trip to the UK, his forces need a bit more time to prepare. The UK pledging more longer-range cruise missiles for Ukraine, as well as lethal attack drones. In the build-up to the Ukrainian offensive, we were shown this American mine-resistant infantry vehicle. When soldiers are inside one of these heavily armoured vehicles, they're protected from heavy explosions and heavy machine gun fire. So when Ukraine is advancing, these vehicles will help save soldiers' lives. The US supplying more than 500 of these to Ukraine. And tonight, the White House saying Russia and Iran are expanding their, quote, unprecedented defence partnership, with Moscow looking to buy more of those lethal Iranian drones to attack Ukrainian cities. Lindsay? Tom, thank you. Another horse has died after a race at Churchill Downs, making it the eighth fatality in recent weeks at the home of the Kentucky Derby. The three-year-old colt Rio Moon was euthanized after suffering a catastrophic injury to his left foreleg a few strides after the wire. Two horses were euthanized after being injured in other races on the same weekend as the Kentucky Derby. Five others were euthanized after training and racing incidents at the track in the days leading up to the Derby. The seven initial deaths are being investigated as a triple crown shifts to the Preakness this week. Weekend. The COVID-19 vaccine from Johnson & Johnson is no longer available in the United States. That's according to the Centers for Disease Control. All remaining doses expired last week, and the CDC directed providers to dispose of any that they had left. Only 19 million people in the U.S. received the J&J &J vaccine since it first became available, compared to more than 230 million doses of the original Moderna vaccine and more than 360 million doses of the original Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Now to the news on the case of the Colorado mom, Suzanne Morphew, who vanished on Mother's Day three years ago with her husband Barry making a tearful plea for her return. He was later charged with her murder, but days before the trial, prosecutors dropped the charges. Now tonight, Barry Morphew is suing for $15 million. ABC's Ariel Reshev has an exclusive interview with him and his daughters. Tonight, an ABC News exclusive. Barry Morphew, the man accused of killing his wife Suzanne after she disappeared on Mother's Day in 2020, speaking only to ABC after first-degree murder and tampering with evidence charges were dropped against him. Barry and their daughters Macy and Mallory say his life has been ruined by false accusations. What have these last three years been like for you? Very, very sad. Very confusing. Just so traumatic. Like, literally, our worst nightmare. 
Did you have anything to do with the disappearance of your wife? <laughs> Absolutely not. Barry filing a $15 million civil suit against prosecutors, the sheriff, and several investigators. So I know that $15 million is a huge number, but I don't think that, in my mind, that covers any of the damage that's happened to Barry and the girls. If they would just look for Suzanne outside of where they hypothesize Barry could have possibly buried her remains, they could find her. Prosecutors say they dropped the charges, hoping for additional evidence, believing they were close to finding Suzanne's body. Prosecutors say Suzanne was having an affair, preparing to leave Barry after he found out, and disappeared shortly after texting Barry, I'm done. What was your first thought? My heart was broke. My heart was broken. I didn't believe it. And the DAs believed that they had their guy. And they believe that there's a mountain of evidence against you. There's just not Suzanne's body. They're wrong. They're, they've got tunnel vision. And they looked at one person, and they've got too much pride to say they're wrong and look somewhere else. Lindsay, the Chafee County Sheriff's Office and the DA saying that they cannot comment on pending litigation or ongoing investigations. Authorities say that Barry Morphew is still a suspect in his wife's disappearance and they're not ruling out future charges. Lindsay. Ariel, thank you. After a contentious election back in February, the new mayor of Chicago was sworn in today. Brandon Johnson was sworn in as the city's 57th mayor Monday, kicking off what he has promised will be four years of reform, progress, and history making. Johnson is stepping up amid multiple complex challenges facing the city, chief among them being an anticipated spike in violence this upcoming summer and a burgeoning crisis of asylum seekers being sent to Chicago from Texas and Colorado. Those will likely be Johnson's first test as mayor as he addressed both in his inaugural remarks. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, a man captures the terrifying moment. A shark jumps out of the water and attacks his kayak. Plus, Martha Stewart makes history gracing a different type of magazine cover. But next, in our Prime Focus, moving forward, one year after a tragedy left 10 people killed in a hate-fueled attack, how some Buffalo residents are helping the community heal. We're here at 238 Carlton, the future site of the African Heritage Food Cooperative grocery store. We're very, very happy to be able to provide healthy options for folks within walking distance in a site that's been victimized by food apartheid. Families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Just the Game Show Show, Wednesday night. Life is like a game show. We all are looking for that jackpot. The chance to win $25,000, $100,000, a million dollars. Love it.
What's better than that? When you give money out on a game show, oh, it's better than sex. Yes, yes, finally, a show about game shows. You know, a lot of famous people have been on game shows. Wait, is that Meghan Markle? Just welcome to the night. game show. show. Wednesday night. night on ABC. You're welcome. Me and my friends started holding hands and we all started to pray. This is one of the most powerful stories I have ever covered. The unthinkable. When I saw him run out, I thought I had lost him. Sadly, after tragedies like this, the world moves on. Well, not this time. <laughs> oh my God. I didn't want another mom to feel this way. You were so glad. This is one special you will never forget. I certainly won't. Reporting from the scene of the Monterey Park mass shooting, I'm Juju Chang. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. It's been one year since 10 black Americans were murdered in a racially motivated attack at a Topps grocery store in Buffalo, New York. In tonight's Prime Focus, we've partnered with our colleagues at ABC News Digital for their project, Buffalo, Healing from Hate, Saving Ourselves, to explore just how this community is coping one year later and what's being done to address the racial inequities that have plagued this community for generations. My family made a conscious decision when this happened that we would not allow our mother to be remembered as a victim and we're not going to live the lives of victims. He took the best of us. These were people who valued family. These were people of faith. These were community members who contributed in so many ways. Since 514, more than $3 billion in projects have been planned or proposed from Buffalo's east side. Unfortunately, uh, the projects will have little if no real impact on Black Buffalo. We keep looking for somebody, nobody's coming in to save us. That power is not something that's outside of us. On an otherwise typical Saturday in East Buffalo, New York, while families took part in the mundane activity of buying groceries, a, lot of people did yeah, yeah. a shooter entered a Topps friendly market and opened fire. People were killed and three others seriously injured in a violent act of hatred. All of the victims black. This is an absolute racist hate crime. This is someone who has hate in their heart, soul, and mind. Behind each name, there is a story and a grieving set of family and friends. 86 years old? What? Why? What was the purpose? At 86, Ruth Whitfield was the oldest of the victims. A devoted wife, her children say, she visited her husband of 68 years who suffers from dementia in a nursing home every day for eight years. Garnell tells us he believes his father's illness is what keeps him from enduring the excruciating pain that his family deals with every day. I called the nursing home, they sent me the footage of persons entering the building that day. My mom was in that footage. I saw what she had on. I was able to describe her outfit to the police officer, to the detective, who went in and identified my mom. When Ruth moved to upstate New York decades ago, her children say it was with the hope of escaping the brutal racism of the South, only to then lose her life here in a racially motivated attack. The Tops was a symbol of a hard-won fight for this community. Built in 2003, it provided a much-needed option in what was previously a food desert, brought on by systemic racism reinforced by decades of segregation. A report by the Brookings Institution and the University of Michigan found that the Buffalo-Niagara Falls metro area is the sixth most segregated area in the nation. 
The dividing lines between white and black splintered by the Kensington Expressway, a massive project built in the 60s touted as urban renewal, placed right in the middle of East Buffalo, the black section of the area. Critics say its lanes allow white residents easy access to the city's downtown area, but that it strips black residents of access to essential businesses like grocery stores, only further exacerbating racial inequity. Buffalo is one of the most segregated urban centers in the United States. This white supremacist knew that only one supermarket serviced the east side, 68,000 black residents. Tops sits in an urban landscape that reflects the ugly realities of Buffalo's brand of structural racism. You gonna come to our city and decide you don't like black people. Me, you don't know a damn thing about black people. We're human. We like our kids to go to good schools. We love our kids. We never go in no neighborhoods and take people out. Don't do it. <laughs> I wanted to kill his ass. I know. Sorry to say it like that. I did too. We got to do something to this man for all the pain. I mean, not only just with my I, I mean, like, I lost my friends too. Roberto was one of my best friends. Marcus is one of my best friends. I mean, these are people I see every day. Damon Massey lost his aunt Catherine Massey, as well as his friends Roberta Drury and Marcus Morrison. Each particular family that has all been through this tragedy, there's no form of healing possible. There's no form of hell impossible. While it's said that time heals all wounds, many of the residents are demanding another remedy. People are making promises. We're gonna, we're gonna give the East Side fifty million dollars, or a hundred million dollars. But a lot of people I talk to say we want to see it. We want to see. We want to see something happen. We want to see those promises fulfilled. Good morning. Here today because my 86-year-old uh, mother was murdered, along with nine other souls uh, while shopping in our, in our community on May 14th. On the surface, it would appear that I, I had made it. You know, I'm blessed with a functional family, uh, gainful employment an opportunity to grab a piece of that much sought after American dream. The problem is, reality keeps waking you up. This didn't just start on May 14th. We've been living with this our entire lives. ABC News reached out to local and state officials regarding the funding promised to East Buffalo. A spokesperson for Governor Hochul told us that the governor will continue to work closely with partners to ensure the community and its residents receive the investments they deserve to build a fairer, more equitable future in Buffalo. Congressman Brian Higgins said, we are making long-term investments that will create jobs, support businesses, revitalize homes, and reconnect neighborhoods. We have delivered more than $1.1 billion in state and federal funding. But local leaders say those resources aren't going to the people who need them most. Right now, based on our analysis, we've got maybe one to two point two billion dollars of projects aimed for the east side that either plan or being implemented. Yet, we suspect that 90 to 95 percent of those dollars will flow through the east side like water through a sieve on route to white communities. Instead of waiting, some community members are taking matters into their own hands. We're here at 238 Carlton, the future site of the African Heritage Food Cooperative grocery store. It's gonna be three floors, a community space, a cafe, and offices. We're very, very happy to be able to provide healthy options for folks within walking distance in a site that's been victimized by food apartheid. A new grocery co-op is now being built in the historic Fruit Belt neighborhood, perhaps a symbol of healing and a concrete example of this community trying to come together. The best way to remember those who were killed is to carry on their legacy to remember how important they were to this community, to carry on their sense of family. 
That's the best way to remember them, to be the best that we can be as a community in Buffalo, New York. I understand that tragedy also presents opportunity. My mother didn't live her life as a victim, even though she lived her whole life being victimized. And I never saw her as a victim, and I'm not going to remember her as a victim, and I'm not going to play the role of a victim either. And so that requires us to speak out. That requires us to work. He refuses to be victimized. And you can see much more of the ABC News digital original report, Buffalo Healing from Hate, Saving Ourselves, at abcnews.com slash us slash buffalo. And we still have lots more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, a surprising discovery during a traffic stop. What police found inside of a rubber pregnant belly. Plus, she's captivating millions of her fans with her genre-bending hits. But global sensation Callie Uchis tells us how her childhood has inspired her sound and what drives her success. A lot of people might make music to become rich, to become famous. Other people, I think, really want to contribute something to the world. And I would like to think that that's the type of artist that I am. And that as long as I continue to retain that intention, that my music will never be compromised. But next, have you ever considered just how much time you spend at work sending emails and attending meetings? A new report has some surprising revelations. We take a closer look by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. To the best friend I could ever ask for, my ultimate ride or die. Ride or die. People are going to start asking questions. We have to get our story straight. Just lay low. Everything's going to be okay. You pushed me past my breaking point. Really, Megan? I hate seeing you like this, but I need to know what happened. And what if you don't like what you hear? Cruel Summer. Season premiere June 5th on Freeform and stream on Hulu. The white people of this nation are sick and tired. My mission was to go inside the KKK for the FBI. The KKK wanted to cut my son in pieces. If it came out that Joe was working with the FBI, you'll pay with your blood. How do you go from a cross burning at night to having breakfast with your kids the next morning? I can't quit. That's not an option. Grand Nighthawk infiltrating the KKK. Now streaming only on Hulu. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every story. Reporting from Quincy, Massachusetts, I'm Stephanie Ramos. Wherever the story is, we will take you there. We're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. If you are suffering from a case of the Mondays, 
Well, our next report may not help at all. Microsoft's annual study of workplace productivity trends is out, and the details aren't pretty. Here they are by the numbers. Many of us spend 8.8 .8 hours a week reading and writing emails and seven and a half hours in meetings. That's two days each week just on email and meetings. Add to that time spent instant messaging and on the phone, and the average employee spends 57% of their workday on communication software. That leaves just 43% of our day available for building spreadsheets, writing presentations, and completing work-related tasks. 64% of the 31,000 workers surveyed worldwide said with so many hours spent communicating, they struggle to actually find time and energy to do their real job. 62% said that they have to spend too much time searching for information, and 68% said that they don't have enough uninterrupted focus time. And the bosses are noticing 60% said that their team's innovation and strategic thinking are lagging because they're racing just to keep up with the effort growing inflow of emails, meetings, and notifications. I can't say that we didn't warn you, but while the report shines a light on the bleak reality of the modern workplace, Microsoft says there is a bright spot in our future. The corporation, which holds a large stake in the company behind ChatGPT, suggests that new AI features embedded in workplace tools like Outlook and PowerPoint promise to relieve some of the drudgery, leaving more time for quality work. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. Cyber attack at a major media company, the significant setbacks as a newspaper tries to restore its systems. Remaking a classic. Senqua Walls is here. He tells us what it was like to step into an iconic role in White Men Can't Jump. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every story. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. 13 women opened their doors to the man who would end their lives. Truth and Lies, The Boston Strangler, the new true crime podcast series. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts and watch Boston Strangler starring Kira Knightley, streaming on Hulu. Just the what? Game Show Show, Wednesday night. Life is like a game show. We all are looking for that jackpot. The chance to win $25,000, $100,000, a million dollars. Love it. What's better than that? When you give money out on a game show, oh, it's better than sex. Yes, yes, finally, a show about game shows. You know, a lot of famous people have been on game shows. Wait, is that Meghan Markle? Just Welcome to the game, game show. show. Wednesday game. night on ABC. You're welcome. Me and my friends started holding hands and we all started to pray. This is one of the most powerful stories I have ever covered. The unthinkable. When I saw him run out, I thought I had lost him. Sadly, after tragedies like this, the world moves on. Well, not this time. <laughs> oh, my God. I didn't want another mom to feel this way. You were so glad you This is one special you will never forget. I certainly won't. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. 
A cyber attack causes major issues at a media company. An NBA player is suspended for the second time in just a few weeks. And Martha Stewart makes history with a different type of magazine. Cover these stories and more in tonight's Rundown. The Philadelphia Inquirer was unable to print its regular Sunday newspaper after an apparent cyber attack disrupted operations over the weekend. The paper is still posting articles on its website. The attack struck just before Philadelphia's mayoral primary election Tuesday. The paper says employees would not be allowed into the Inquirer's offices through at least Tuesday because of the disruptions, but assured readers that the situation will not affect news coverage. Memphis Grizzlies point guard John Morant once again facing consequences suspended for a second time. After this now deleted Instagram live video made the rounds online, the NBA star appears to quickly flash a gun in the driver's seat of a car. The team issuing a statement shortly after saying we're aware of the social media video involving John Morant. He is suspended from all team activities pending league review. Back in March, Morant was suspended for a similar incident, benched for eight games. Officials in South Carolina busted two people carrying cocaine in a pregnant belly. After pulling over Anthony Miller and Samika Mitchum at a traffic stop, deputies said they became suspicious when the pair couldn't agree on Mitchum's due date. Officials said Mitchum took off running, after which the cocaine quickly fell from the rubber belly. Deputies said Miller and Mitchum were arrested on trafficking charges, and more than 1,500 grams of cocaine was recovered. A close encounter with a shark caught on camera. Scott Haraguchi happened to be filming while fishing on a kayak in Hawaii when a shark was suddenly seen swimming up and ramming into him. The shark stayed with the kayak briefly before Haraguchi gave it a swift kick back into the water. Haraguchi told KITV that he continued fishing after the encounter and said he thought the tiger shark might have confused his kayak for a wounded seal that he spotted shortly after. Sweden came away the big winner of the Eurovision Song Contest. Maureen's power ballad Tattoo beat out 25 other competitors over the weekend. It's Sweden's seventh Eurovision win overall. For Laureen herself, it's her second time winning the contest, having also taken the 2012 prize. The event is traditionally held in the country that won the prior year's contest, which this year would have been Ukraine. But because of the ongoing war with Russia, this year's was held in the UK. The latest edition of the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Issue will feature a familiar face. Martha Stewart was announced as one of this year's cover models and at 81 years old becomes the oldest cover model in Swimsuit Issue history. The entrepreneur, TV host, and author is one of four cover models this year alongside Megan Fox, Kim Petras, and Brooks Nader. The issues will come out May 18th. Now the latest in our series, Streamlined, where we bring you some of the biggest films and TV series hitting digital screens worldwide, speaking with some of the actors and creators behind them. The 1992 classic film, White Men Can't Jump, surpassed expectations upon its release, cleverly weaving elements of culture into the storyline. This magic is now being rebooted to reflect the societal landscape of today through a highly anticipated remake starring actor Cinqua Walls and rapper Jack Harlow. Let's take a look. Ball. I just noticed you're not getting enough legs on a new shot. Are you dehydrated? 100 bucks, you can't make more shots. Let's just do 300. It's not my dad's money. We ain't never gonna get a reparation that way, bro. So I prefer Venmo or Zelle, but you seem like a Cash App guy, so. Ladies and gentlemen, every Hooper I know is entering that big ass tournament with a winner get 500,000. I just need somebody who can play so I can make some money. Be joking, right? Actor Cinco Walls is here. Now, I'm looking forward to seeing this. I'm glad, I'm glad. Thank you. Right, this is one of the biggest sports remakes to come out in a yes. while. What yes. was the pressure like knowing how loved this was from the beginning? You know what's interesting? I grew up a kid, um, a fan of the film, and watching it so many times. So it wasn't necessarily a pressure, but more for me, like a responsibility. And I felt like, you know, I was the guy for the job to step in. I grew up a Wesley Snipes fan. I grew up a Woody Harrelson fan. So I understood the magnitude of that Going into this, we need to do everything we could to make sure we honored them and then updated the story. So it wasn't as much pressure as more as a responsibility to make mm. sure I made them proud and they could walk away going, okay, you did everything you could and left it on the on the court. Left it all out. Left there. it all on the court. And of course you play Kamal, Wesley Snipes Correct. character. Yes. How did you draw inspiration from that, but at the same time make this your own? You know, I mean, 
to be honest, Kamal and, and, and Wesley's character, Sydney, are so different in who they are as men and the iteration of who they become in this new and updated story. So a lot of it was just making sure that there was like a ground itself. The biggest thing that I noticed for the two is that they have a lot of confidence. And Wesley entered into the story with a lot of confidence. He kept that confidence and it grew. Uh, Kamal, when he walked into the story, he's lacking a lot of confidence. And he's not the person that we see him become over the course of the, st of the story. So I had to, you know, um, I guess, remove some of his confidence from the beginning mm -hmm. and then return it back in the end. Oh, of course, when we're looking at the 1992 version, yeah. part of that, it's not so much about basketball as it is about race in a lot of dimensions, really, right, when you think right, about it. Right. How were you guys able to take that and really modernize it, still have that cultural relevance for Absolutely. now? Absolutely. I think... And like you said, I think the biggest thing for 92 was that it always was indicative of culture. And I think that's what any great movie has. I think that's what great stories have, are making sure they weave a lot of culture into the background of any story or filmatic story that they're telling. And for us, mental health is so important now. I think people are on a, on a journey of expansion and learning what they can do internally to help themselves and the people around them. And tell us about that why that is so important, especially for men, yeah. to be able to see and talk yeah. about mental health and that journey that really unites the two characters. You know, I think mental health, I'm a huge advocate for it. I believe in it myself. Um, I always try to talk about it consistently. I think for men specifically, black men specifically, it's important to make sure that you know what you're going through so that you can help yourself, help people around you, and you can kind of like demystify the ability that you have to have it all figured out that you have to be strong in every circumstance because all of us are sometimes fashioning strength when a lot of times we're fractured and we need to have a community and a village for people around us to help us. So many layers to this yeah. movie yeah. Uh, that, that's really significant. And you and Jack have a really great chemistry. Yeah. You and I were talking earlier about how this was his first movie. Normally people know him as a rapper. As a rapper, Jack what, Harlow, yeah. What did you guys do in order to, to really build on that? You know, it's, I always say this. I think Jack and I both come from a similar space and time we came through a, we come from a similar agreement in life which is to just let each other be themselves mm. i never tried to force myself on jack jack never tried to force himself on me and we understood the responsibility the magnitude of it and we were just like all right so at the end of the day all we have is each other yeah and if we're gonna get you know off this island or if we're gonna make it back to shore we have to lean on each other, but it, it started with us just not judging each other and just letting each other be themselves. Of course, you, as we discussed, uh, played college basketball. You know, you're a ball player. Yeah. How about Jack? Can he jump? Listen, listen, I say, I've said this. You know, it's called White Man Can't Jump. For that white man can't jump. <laughs> he cannot? <laughs> he can actually jump. No, oh, that white can. man can he jump. He can. I, I was surprised. Jack is very athletic. He did all of his own stunts. Um, he dunked it every single time. There was oh. a time when Jack had to do it about 13 times, and he got up and got that dunk every time. And one time he actually stared me down, and I was like, are you in character, or are you just trying to let me know? <laughs> <laughs> Cinqua, so looking forward to this. Thank you for Thank joining you. us tonight. Really appreciate that. Want to let all of our viewers know white men can't jump, except for Jack, who can. <laughs> It'll be streaming May 19th on Hulu. Cool vocals and a sensual stage presence. It's rising star Kali Uchi's Time to Shine. The Grammy Award winner is dominating the charts and now dominating the stage, too. ABC contributor Roxy Diaz spent time with the American Colombian singer songwriter just a few hours before the first of two sold out shows at Radio City Music Hall. Entrancing, sensual, and luxurious. Grammy Award winning Colombian American artist Kali Uchis is captivating fans across the world. Becoming a global sensation while paying homage to her Latin roots and remaining true to her artistry. With genre bending hits like Telepatia and See You Again. Can I get a kiss? Kali is breaking industry standards and is now among the many great artists to play at the legendary Radio City Music Hall in New York City with two sold out shows. I had a chance to spend time with the 28 year old to talk about her road to the top hours before her performance. Radio City Music Hall, like it's huge. Frank Sinatra, Mariah Carey, Lady Gaga, Diana Ross, like your name are now amongst the people that have sold out here. Has it hit you yet? Honestly, I had no idea because since I'm not from New York, I didn't realize until people from my friends from New York were like, no, this is major. This venue is so iconic. Carly Marina Loaiza, born in Virginia and raised between the U.S. and Pereira, Colombia.
Her family constantly traveled back and forth, the songwriter absorbing the differences in culture that would soon influence her artistry. We were supposed to stay living in, in Colombia the rest of my life. That was our plan. So I kind of had to relearn what it was like to live in the United States. I had to relearn a lot of, because I was so young. Kali found solace in music, expressing herself through poetry and directing music videos. When did you first know you wanted to do music? I realized what I was going to pursue probably when I was like a senior in high school. Okay. And because that was when I really had to start thinking about whether I wanted to pursue, you know, going to college or what I wanted to do in my life. I mean, my whole life I had been writing poems, I had been recording songs, and um, I was in jazz bands, I played saxophone, I played piano, so I was always a musical person. Mm -hmm. How did that play with their family when they found out you wanted to pursue music? Like, I can just imagine, most of most of our Latin parents, they're like, no, yeah. you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a lawyer. Yeah. You know, you say you're going to do music. Eso no te va a dar comida, eso no te va a pagar, you know? So, yeah, like, I mean, the main reason why we brought family to the United States and came to the United States was in order to, like, get an education. Um, my dad had a fourth grade education, and he grew up in the streets, so it was really hard for him to understand why I wouldn't take advantage of, you know, being able to go to community college. So it was definitely, I think, I think it's hard for any parent to understand that first because it's, it's such a risky job. Gali stayed true to herself, creating music in both English and Spanish. I want all small artists to know that you don't need to be just in one category, one genre, one language. And was presented with the Variety Hitmakers Crossover Award in 2021. This year marks five years since the release of her elusive, critically acclaimed debut album, Isolation, taking fans to her world with Tyrant. And After the Storm with Tyler, the creator. The singer released her highly anticipated third studio album, Red Moon and Venus, in March. and plans to release her second Spanish album later this year. Do you really identify with a crossover artist as a label on you? When I was first working on Sin Miedo, which was my second album, but it was my first Latin album, everybody, um, you know, the label, they were very against it because they're like, you're not gonna be able to translate to the Latin market. But for me, like I said, growing up bilingual, I'm like, that's gonna be inauthentic for me to just keep going in English. and. So they told me, they're like, we're not going to support you at all. I was like, OK, it's fine. It doesn't matter. It's, really, it's what I really, really want to do. I'm going to do it. There's no denying Gale's impact with over 29 million listeners on Spotify and her bilingual track, Telepatia, streamed over 800 million times. The fact that you were able to open up this land, do you feel more pressure now? No, I still don't feel pressure. I don't think that my idea of success or my goals and my ambitions have ever been tied to numbers. My goals and the things that I wish to do are more so tied to not compromising. Mm -hmm. And I think that the person who really wins is the person that does whatever they want to do every day and really is happy. But you do compromise with your fans because they were in an uproar when you first started this tour and they weren't happy with the set list. You actually <laughs> changed the set list no, for right. your okay, fans. No, like, this is what they need to understand. <laughs> I started the tour having no rehearsals for the tour. So I had to basically figure it out as I go along, mm -hmm. which is always kind of what I was planning to do. So the first few shows was kind of, in a sense, like my rehearsals. So I told them, like, don't think that you bullied me into changing the set list because <laughs> the set list was going to change regardless. Thousands lined up outside of Radio City, eager to watch the show-stopping high femme fantasy come to life. <laughs> Some even breaking out in song. Kali, I love you. Thank you for inspiring me to love my body and love me for who I am. You guys came all the way from Minnesota yeah, here for the show. Yeah, yeah. How long have you been planning this? For like a month and a half. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. Kali transporting fans Kali Uchi. into her fantasy world of glamour. Yeah. 
you come across as such a very shy, I am shy, quiet, yeah. timid person, beautiful, but then you get on stage and it's like a whole nother being up there. It's like a different Cali. Is that something that you just keep yourself private? Um, I think there's just a lot of different sides to me. Like there's, you know, um, are you a Gemini? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a Cancer, but I think um, I feel that there is there are so many different dimensions that I'm able to really express myself fully when it comes to music and when it comes to performing. <laughs> You promise to stay yourself and true to that, true to your sound. Yeah. How do you plan on doing that? Yeah, I think just forever. I think the most important thing, I think intention. Everyone has different intentions for why they do what they do. Somebody, some people, a lot of people might make music to become rich, to become famous. Other people, I think, really want to contribute something to the world deeper and more meaningful than that. And I would like to think that that's the type of artist that I am. And that as long as I continue to retain that, that intention, that my music will never be compromised. Will never be compromised. Our thanks to Roxy for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Hour, the latest on another mass shooting in America, what we're learning about the dangerous confrontation between police and the suspect in a residential neighborhood, and a terrifying fight against a marine predator. A 13-year-old recounts her battle to survive a shark attack. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every story. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, a deadly mass shooting. Two police officers among those shot. The image is coming in at this hour. At least three people dead. Those two police officers wounded. The gunman taken down by police in New Mexico. Homes and vehicles reportedly hit by gunfire. Schools across the city placed on lockdown. Kena Whitworth reporting. The attack at a U.S. congressman's office in Virginia. Authorities say the suspect armed with a bat looking for the congressman, the staffers who were attacked. Tonight, after a four-year investigation, the Trump-era special counsel and the 300-page report on the FBI's Russia investigation. 
deeply critical of the FBI Pierre Thomas in Washington. Tonight, the newest warning from Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, making it clear the U.S. could default as soon as June 1st. And even coming close to that date, she says, with this political battle, could damage the U.S. economy. So where does this stand tonight? What the president is now saying, what House Speaker Kevin McCarthy told our Rachel Scott today. The southern border tonight and the Biden administration now reporting migrant crossings are down more than 50 percent since Title 42 expired. So what's driving this? Will Carr on the border. The war in Ukraine tonight and the dramatic images coming in from the battle for Bakhmut. Ukrainian fighters making their most significant advance in six months. Images tonight of Russian forces being captured and what they say this video shows. Here in the U.S., the husband accused of killing his wife after she disappeared on Mother's Day in 2020, sitting down with our Ariel Reshev, his daughters sitting beside him. Charges have now been dropped. What he's now saying and what prosecutors are still signaling about the husband. Tonight, we're tracking severe storms, damaging winds and large hail from Missouri all the way east to Virginia over the next 24 hours. In the west, record heat and in the Pacific Northwest tonight, this rare May heat wave. Martha Stewart on the cover of the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Issue. At a sign of the times, what is the average age of cars and trucks on the road right now? What drivers are now saying about this. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, and it's great to start another week with all of you at home. We do begin tonight with this deadly mass shooting. At least three people dead in northwest New Mexico. Two officers among those shot rushed to the hospital, several others injured. The urgent call about an active shooter going out. You could actually hear gunshots still going off on the call. They were radioing that several people were already down. Multiple agencies responding, three people found dead. All schools put on lockdown while they search for the suspect. Officers confronting him, shooting him dead. ABC's Kena Whitworth leading us off tonight. Tonight, the urgent investigation into a mass shooting in Farmington, New Mexico, that left at least three people dead, two police officers wounded, and seven other people injured. Police say the 18-year-old alleged gunman seen here pacing outside of a church wearing all black and holding a gun was also killed. There's multiple shots still going off in the background on our open lines. Authorities from multiple agencies responding to reports of an active shooter northwest of Albuquerque around 11 a.m. Officers responded to the area to find a chaotic scene where a male subject was actively firing upon individuals in that neighborhood. Be advised, I got several people down. Schools citywide put on lockdown as police search for the shooter. I have eyes on the suspect. He's walking south. Officers confronting and killing the suspect. The two injured officers now in stable condition at the hospital. Multiple homes and vehicles reportedly hit by gunfire. Witnesses describing the horror. I'm in my garage and I hear this rap 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 so far this year there have been at least 225 mass shootings in the united states according to the gun violence archive so now david authorities are investigating a crime scene that is several blocks long in a residential neighborhood but the schools that were on lockdown have since reopened and the fbi says they're standing by ready to assist if need be david Kena Whitworth leading us off tonight. Kena, thank you. We're going to turn now to the violent attack at the office of Virginia Congressman Jerry Conley, a man showing up at the office armed with a metal baseball bat, asking for the congressman, and then assaulting two of his staffers, others in the office running to hide. Here's ABC's Janae Norman tonight. Tonight, the targeted attack at a congressman's office. You could absolutely tell that the people inside were scared. They were hiding. Two staffers for Virginia Democratic Representative Jerry Connolly rushed to the hospital after police say a man walked into his Fairfax, Virginia district office and attacked them with a metal baseball bat. Someone swinging a bat around, I, mean, I would be scared as well. The alleged attacker, identified as 49-year-old Schwan Katron Pham, Connolly's office, telling ABC News he hit a senior aide in the head and an intern in the upper body. Police say the suspect asked for the congressman by name, but Connolly well, was at a ribbon cutting for a food bank in his district at the time. What is it you're trying to protect? 
Connolly, a Democrat who serves on the House Foreign Affairs and House Oversight Committees, writing, my district office staff make themselves available to constituents and members of the public every day. The thought that someone would take advantage of my staff's accessibility to commit an act of violence is unconscionable and devastating. And no word yet on a motive, but authorities say they are looking into mental illness as a potential factor. And David, as for that intern who was injured, we're told it was their first day on the job. David. That's really something. Janae Norman. Janae, thank you. Well, late today, the final report made public by the Trump era special counsel investigating the origins of the FBI's Russia investigation. John Durham, appointed by former President Trump's Attorney General Bill Barr in his 300 page report, deeply critical of the FBI. Here's our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas, tonight. Tonight, the end of a long road for Special Counsel John Durham, who was appointed by Donald Trump's Attorney General Bill Barr four years ago to dig into the origins of the FBI's Russia investigation into Trump and his campaign. The Biden administration left Durham in place to complete his work, and in his final report, he slams the FBI indicating they never should have launched a probe in the first place, since neither U.S. law enforcement nor the intelligence community appears to have possessed any actual evidence of collusion. Instead, Durham found that the Bureau relied on raw, unanalyzed and uncorroborated intelligence, noting that there was significant reliance on investigative leads provided or funded directly or indirectly by Trump's political opponents. An example, the so-called Steele dossier, of allegations prepared by former British spy Christopher Steele. Durham found the FBI was unable to corroborate a single substantive allegation from the dossier. But Trump's own comments about Russia in the campaign added to questions about possible collusion. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. Durham found the FBI failed to critically analyze information that ran counter to the narrative of a Trump-Russia collusive relationship, calling that extremely troublesome. But Durham's investigation, which cost taxpayers $6.5 million, falls far short of proving there was a deep state conspiracy against Trump. The special counsel brought no charges against any senior intelligence or law enforcement officials. And the two major cases he did pursue both ended in acquittals. Durham only convicted one lower-level FBI official of misconduct in pursuing an electronic surveillance warrant. So let's get right to Pierre Thomas live in Washington tonight. And Pierre, I know the FBI is now responding to the special counsel's report. David, the special counsel's blistering assessment of the FBI tracks closely with a 2019 highly critical report from the DOJ Inspector General. Tonight, the FBI said it already has put in place dozens of corrective actions that might have prevented those mistakes that were made. David. Pierre Thomas tonight. Thank you, Pierre. We're going to turn now to the U.S. border with Mexico tonight. And amid so much concern, we have now learned that after Title 42 expired and after new rules kicked in, the Biden administration now saying the number of people seeking entry has actually been cut in half. So what's driving this and will this trend continue? ABC's Will Carr from Brownsville, Texas tonight. Tonight, a significant drop in encounters at the border from over 10,000 per day just before Title 42 expired to around 4,200 on Saturday. New rules require non-Mexican migrants to have been denied asylum in another country or apply for an interview through an app. If they don't, they could be deported and barred from entering the U.S. for five years. The message that there are consequences in place at the border is an important one that we hope is resonating. In cities at the border and around the country are already at a breaking point. New York City receiving hundreds of asylum seekers every day, more than 4,200 last week alone, reopening the iconic Roosevelt Hotel as an arrival center. I crossed into Mexico to see the conditions at a massive border camp with more than 1,500 migrants in Matamoros. There are quite literally piles of garbage here. You can smell it. There's smoke in the air. They're burning. They're cooking. They're doing everything they can to uh, try to sustain themselves. Many migrants tell me they're trying to use the CBP app but have run into glitches or having trouble with service. Still, this woman fleeing violence from Honduras, walking the majority of the way to the border, says she's willing to wait. Tonight, federal authorities say that hundreds of migrants have been forced back into Mexico and thousands more are in custody going through their asylum interviews. They say they are still prepared if there is a surge in the coming days or weeks.
David. Will Carr on the U.S. border in Brownsville, Texas tonight. Will, thank you. We're going to turn now to the U.S. economy in this political battle over the debt ceiling tonight. The newest warning from Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen making it clear that the U.S. could default as soon as June 1st. And her warning that even coming close to that date with this political battle could damage the U.S. economy. So tonight what the president is now saying, and Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy with our Rachel Scott on the Hill tonight. Tonight, with time running out, President Biden is summoning top congressional leaders back to the White House. What day? Over the weekend, the president insisting progress has been made. I really think there's a desire on their part as well as ours to reach agreement. I think we'll be able to do it. But today, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy tells me they are nowhere near a deal. It's just staff moving ideas back and forth, but there's no movement. Are you confident that it'll happen by the end of the week, Speaker McCarthy? Not based upon what they're offering right now, no. McCarthy says he will not raise the debt limit unless the president agrees to spending cuts. Sources say on the table, clawing back unspent COVID funds, streamlining regulations for new energy projects, and imposing stricter work requirements for certain federal aid programs. The consequences of a default would be dire. Social security payments would halt. Troops could go unpaid. And by one projection, nearly 8 million people could lose their jobs. Default is not an option. Its consequences are too damaging, too severe. It must, must be taken off the table. So let's bring in Rachel Scott. She's live up on the Hill again tonight. Rachel, as you know, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen again sounding the alarm warning the U.S. Uh, could default as soon as June 1st and even warning that getting close to that date could have real consequences. David, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is making it clear that even waiting to the last minute to raise the debt limit could disrupt financial markets, negatively impacting consumers and businesses, and also downgrade the credit rating for the United States. The closer we get to default, the worse it gets, which is why tonight she is urging Congress to act quickly. David. Rachel Scott following this every step of the way for us. Thanks, Rachel. We're going to turn now to the war in Ukraine. Tonight, there appears to be a major advance. Ukrainian officials say their soldiers have made their most significant advance in six months. Tonight, here are the dramatic images from the battle for Bakhmut, Russian forces being captured. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge on the ground in Ukraine for us again tonight. Tonight, the most significant advance for Ukraine in six months. Dramatic drone video showing Ukrainian forces storming Russian positions near Bakhmut, taking land to the north and south. <sighs> Ukrainian troops lobbing grenades to clear trenches, capturing Russian soldiers. Today, President Zelensky suggesting the gains near Bakhmut are not the beginning of a major counteroffensive, saying on a trip to the UK, his forces need a bit more time to prepare. The UK pledging more longer-range cruise missiles for Ukraine, as well as lethal attack drones. In the build-up to the Ukrainian offensive, we were shown this American mine-resistant infantry vehicle. When soldiers are inside one of these heavily armoured vehicles, they're protected from heavy explosions and heavy machine gun fire. So when Ukraine is advancing, these vehicles will help save soldiers' lives. The US supplying more than 500 of these to Ukraine. And tonight, the White House saying Russia and Iran are expanding their, quote, unprecedented defence partnership, with Moscow looking to buy more of those lethal Iranian drones to attack Ukrainian cities. David? That's a relationship the U.S. is watching closely as well. Tom Sufi Burridge, thank you. Now to Turkey tonight, a key NATO ally in the race for the president is now headed to a tense runoff there. Neither President Erdogan nor his main rival winning 50 percent of the vote. They'll face off again in two weeks' time. Erdogan has led Turkey for 20 years now. Back here in the U.S. and the husband from Colorado accused of killing his wife after she disappeared on Mother's Day in 2020, speaking out for the first time since charges were dropped against him. What he's now saying, his daughter's by his side, and what prosecutors are still signaling about that husband. ABC's Ariel Reshef tonight with the interview. Tonight, an ABC News exclusive. Barry Morphew, the man accused of killing his wife Suzanne after she disappeared on Mother's Day in 2020, speaking only to ABC after first-degree murder and tampering with evidence charges were dropped against him. Barry and their daughters, Macy and Mallory, say his life has been ruined by false accusations. What have these last three years been like for you? Very, very sad. Very confusing. Just so traumatic. Like, literally, our worst nightmare. 
Did you have anything to do with the disappearance of your wife? <laughs> Absolutely not. Barry filing a $15 million civil suit against prosecutors, the sheriff, and several investigators. So I know that $15 million is a huge number, but I don't think that, in my mind, that covers any of the damage that's happened to Barry and the girls. If they would just look for Suzanne outside of where they hypothesize Barry could have possibly buried her remains, they could find her. Prosecutors say they dropped the charges, hoping for additional evidence, believing they were close to finding Suzanne's body. Prosecutors say Suzanne was having an affair, preparing to leave Barry after he found out, and disappeared shortly after texting Barry, I'm done. What was your first thought? My heart was broke. My heart was broken. I didn't believe it. And the DAs believed that they had their guy and they believe that there's a mountain of evidence against you. There's just not Suzanne's body. They're wrong. They're, they've got tunnel vision, and they looked at one person, and they've got too much pride to say they're wrong and look somewhere else. David, the Chafee County Sheriff's Office and the DA saying that they do not comment on pending litigation or on ongoing investigation. Authorities telling ABC News that Barry Morphew is still a suspect in his wife's disappearance and they're not ruling out future charges. David. Ariel Russia reporting on the case force. Ariel, thank you. When we come back on a Monday night, we're tracking severe storms tonight into tomorrow. Damaging winds, large hail, several states from Missouri all the way east. We're going to time this out for you. And the shark attack tonight coming very close with the kayak looked like whenever news breaks the crush of families here in poland here in kentucky no match for the tornado from monterey park california on the ground in ukraine reporting from uvalde texas abc news live is right there everywhere from the scene of that deadly missile strike in dnipro ukraine reporting from the earthquake in turkey from charleston south carolina on the 2024 campaign trail from Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. Reporting from Santa Fe, New Mexico, I'm Lindsay Davis. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. 
Tonight, we are tracking severe storms on the move at this hour. Millions are on alert for damaging winds and large hail from Missouri to Virginia. This is through tomorrow. You can see the region in the path there. A rare May heat wave continues in the Pacific Northwest tonight. Seattle and Portland both hitting record highs over the weekend. And in California this week, temperatures closing in already on triple digits. A close call for a fisherman off Hawaii. Video showing a tiger shark attacking his kayak. Wow. About a mile off Oahu, the shark biting the kayak, the fisherman then kicking it away. He wasn't hurt. He says he kept fishing and didn't realize how serious it was until he looked at the video afterward. When we come back tonight, Martha Stewart on the cover of the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. And this question tonight, what's the average age of cars on the roads these days? In a moment. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every story. Brooke Shields, the most photographed woman in the world. A sexualized child model. Exploitation. What happened to her isn't really about hers, it's just about women. I let myself be vulnerable, and this is the first time I've ever spoken about what happened. I thought my one no should have been enough, you know. When someone like Brooke Shields talks about it, it makes a difference. I'm amazed that I survived any of it. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. Oh, wait, there is. Bring your friends. Good morning, America. GMA 7A. Now that's how you start your day. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasure that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. To the index of other news, and tonight a new report finds more Americans are driving their cars much longer. The average age of a passenger vehicle is now 12 and a half years old. Edmunds.com says the average cost of a new vehicle in the U.S. is now nearly $48,000. Gas prices, higher car loan rates, and the microchip shortage are all factors, of course. Tonight, Martha Stewart making history. At 81, she's now the oldest swimsuit model to appear on the cover of the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Issue. She says she hopes the cover inspires people to try new things. The issue on newsstands this Thursday. Good for you, Martha. When we come back here tonight, the graduating class and the one person they all stopped to hug, even before getting their diploma, and it wasn't their parents. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every story. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. 13 women opened their doors to the man who would end their lives. Truth and Lies, The Boston Strangler, the new true crime podcast series. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts and watch Boston Strangler starring Kira Knightley, streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> How cute. 
Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Right now in America, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. Oh wait, there is. Bring your friends. Good morning, America. GMA 7A. Now that's how you start your day. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Finally tonight here, America Strong. Grateful for their diploma and grateful for Miss Val. High Point University in North Carolina, commencement day. Come on, girl. Come on. <laughs> the graduating class in cap and gown, the graduates stopping, though, to hug someone special. Hello. That security guard, Valerie Baxter. To everyone on campus, she's simply Miss Vale. Y'all better come back to see me. I love you, well. I love you guys. No students, no strangers to Miss Vale's hugs. She's been at High Point University for more than a decade, and every year when the school year starts, welcome home. We missed you guys. Miss Vale telling parents, "Don't worry. If your son or daughter ever needs a hug." I'm right here. We love you. This year at commencement, the hugs were for Miss Val. We love you, Miss Val. And right here tonight, the students grateful. Hi, David. Hi, David. Hi, David. Business graduate Jake Gurman on Miss Val and her impact. She is such an amazing and extraordinary person. She is so caring, so personable. And it just goes to show why she had such a huge line uh, to hug her at graduation. Communications graduate Julie Segala tonight. I can definitely confirm that Miss Val is like a campus mom to us all. <laughs> Business graduate Christy Cusia and her hug. Every time I pulled into campus, she always knew how to put a smile on my face. She just knew how to make High Point feel like home. <laughs> we salute the graduates, and of course, we salute Miss Val. I'll see you tomorrow. Good night. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every story. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the nation's capital, I'm Gio Benitez. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm 
Lindsay Davis, thank you so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to tonight, including the mass shooting that took place in New Mexico. At least three people dead, others injured. We'll have the latest developments. Plus, the financial cliff we could be heading toward if Congress doesn't act and soon, and the dangerous cyclone that almost wiped out thousands of people. But we do begin tonight with yet another mass shooting in this country, the cycle of gun violence hitting Farmington, New Mexico today. At least three people have died and two officers are wounded after confronting and killing the gunman. A call about an active shooter went out around 11 a.m. local time. Nearby homes and cars were reportedly struck by gunfire during the confrontation in this residential neighborhood, while local schools were placed on lockdown for a terrifying two hours. Authorities are still searching for a motive at this hour, and ABC's Kana Whitworth leads us off. Tonight, the urgent investigation into a mass shooting in Farmington, New Mexico, that left at least three people dead, two police officers wounded, and seven other people injured. Police say the 18-year-old alleged gunman seen here pacing outside of a church wearing all black and holding a gun was also killed. There's multiple shots still going off in the background on our open lines. Authorities from multiple agencies responding to reports of an active shooter northwest of Albuquerque around 11 a.m. Officers responded to the area to find a chaotic scene where a male subject was actively firing upon individuals in that neighborhood. Be advised, I got several people down. Schools citywide put on lockdown as police search for the shooter. I have eyes on the suspect. He's walking south. Officers confronting and killing the suspect. The two injured officers now in stable condition at the hospital. Multiple homes and vehicles reportedly hit by gunfire. Witnesses describing the horror. I'm in my garage and I hear this rap, 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 rap. So far this year, there have been at least 225 mass shootings in the United States, according to the Gun Violence Archive. Our thanks to Kana. Now to the other big story playing out tonight after a man carried out a violent attack at the office of Virginia Congressman Jerry Connolly. The assailant showed up with a metal baseball bat, asked for the congressman, and then assaulted two of Connolly's staff members as others ran to hide. One of the two staffers was an intern marking her very first day on the job. It's all part of an alarming trend of violence on the nation's elected officials, with threats against lawmakers increasing 400% in just the last six years. Janae Norman has more on this disturbing attack. Tonight, the targeted attack at a congressman's office. You could absolutely tell that the people inside were scared. They were hiding. Two staffers for Virginia Democratic Representative Jerry Connolly rushed to the hospital after police say a man walked into his Fairfax, Virginia district office and attacked them with a metal baseball bat. Someone swinging a bat around, I, mean, I would be scared as well. The alleged attacker, identified as 49-year-old Schwan Katron Pham, Connolly's office, telling ABC News he hit a senior aide in the head and an intern in the upper body. Police say the suspect asked for the congressman by name, but Connolly okay. was at a food ribbon cutting for a food yeah, bank in his district at the time. What is it you're trying to protect? Connolly, a Democrat who serves on the House Foreign Affairs and House Oversight Committees, writing, my district office staff make themselves available to constituents and members of the public every day. The thought that someone would take advantage of my staff's accessibility to commit an act of violence is unconscionable and devastating. Our thanks to Janae for that. Now to the final report of the special counsel investigating the origins of the FBI's probe of the Trump campaign's possible ties to Russia. After a four-year investigation finding the FBI never should have launched the Trump-Russia probe, here's ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Tonight, the end of a long road for special counsel John Durham, who was appointed by Donald Trump's Attorney General Bill Barr four years ago to dig into the origins of the FBI's Russia investigation into Trump and his campaign. The Biden administration left Durham in place to complete his work, and in his final report, he slams the FBI, indicating they never should have launched a probe in the first place, since neither U.S. law enforcement nor the intelligence community appears to have possessed any actual evidence of collusion. Instead, Durham found that the Bureau relied on raw, unanalyzed, and uncorroborated intelligence, noting that there was significant reliance on investigative leads provided or funded directly or indirectly by Trump's political opponents. An example, the so-called Steele dossier of allegations prepared by former British spy Christopher Steele. Durham found the FBI was unable to corroborate a single substantive allegation from the dossier. 
But Trump's own comments about Russia in the campaign added to questions about possible collusion. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. Durham found the FBI failed to critically analyze information that ran counter to the narrative of a Trump-Russia collusive relationship, calling that extremely troublesome. But Durham's investigation, which cost taxpayers $6.5 million, falls far short of proving there was a deep state conspiracy against Trump. The special counsel brought no charges against any senior intelligence or law enforcement officials. And the two major cases he did pursue both ended in acquittals. Durham only convicted one lower-level FBI official of misconduct in pursuing an electronic surveillance warrant. Our thanks to Pierre Thomas. A former associate of Rudy Giuliani is suing him for alleged sexual assault and harassment, wage theft, and other misconduct. Noelle Dunphy says Giuliani started abusing her almost immediately after she was hired as his director of business development back in 2019, including allegedly demanding sexual favors and asking her to defer her salary because he was in the middle of a nasty divorce. Ultimately, she claims he never paid her at all. There has been no comment yet from Giuliani. Now to the border after Title 42 expired Thursday night and new rules kicked in. Biden administration officials say the expected surge didn't happen and the number of people seeking entry has been cut in half. But thousands have gathered on the Mexican side of the border and many more are on the way. ABC's Will Carr is at a processing center in Brownsville, Texas. Tonight, a significant drop in encounters at the border from over 10,000 per day just before Title 42 expired to around 4,200 on Saturday. New rules require non-Mexican migrants to have been denied asylum in another country or apply for an interview through an app. If they don't, they could be deported and barred from entering the U.S. for five years. The message that there are consequences in place at the border is an important one that we hope is resonating. In cities at the border and around the country are already at a breaking point. New York City receiving hundreds of asylum seekers every day, more than 4,200 last week alone, reopening the iconic Roosevelt Hotel as an arrival center. I crossed into Mexico to see the conditions at a massive border camp with more than 1,500 migrants in Matamoros. There are quite literally piles of garbage here. You can smell it. There's smoke in the air. They're burning. They're cooking. They're doing everything they can to uh, try to sustain themselves. Many migrants tell me they're trying to use the CBP app, but have run into glitches or are having trouble with service. Still, this woman fleeing violence from Honduras, walking the majority of the way to the border, says she's willing to wait. Our thanks to Will. Time is running out on the debt ceiling standoff that could have a global ripple effect. President Biden and congressional leaders are set to meet tomorrow before the president leaves for a G7 summit on Wednesday. The president is expecting some optimism, but House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says they're still far apart in talks. ABC's senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest. Tonight, with time running out, President Biden is summoning top congressional leaders back to the White House. What day? Over the weekend, the president insisting progress has been made. I really think there's a desire on their part as well as ours to reach agreement. I think we'll be able to do it. But today, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy tells me they are nowhere near a deal. It's just staff moving ideas back and forth, but there's no movement. Are you confident like... that it'll happen by the end of the week, Speaker McCarthy? Not based upon what they're offering right now, no. McCarthy says he will not raise the debt limit unless the president agrees to spending cuts. Sources say on the table, clawing back unspent COVID funds, streamlining regulations for new energy projects, and imposing stricter work requirements for certain federal aid programs. The consequences of a default would be dire. Social Security payments would halt. Troops could go unpaid. And by one projection, nearly 8 million people could lose their jobs. Default is not an option. Its consequences are too damaging, too severe. It must, must be taken off the table. Our thanks to Rachel for that. The COVID-19 vaccine from Johnson & Johnson is no longer available in the United States, according to the Centers for Disease Control. All remaining doses expired last week, and the CDC directed providers to dispose of any that they had left. Only 19 million people in the U.S. received the J&J &J vaccine since it first became available, compared to more than 230 million doses of the original Moderna vaccine and more than 360 million doses of the original Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. 
Ukraine's deputy defense minister says Ukrainian soldiers continue to gain ground in the battle for Bakhmut. Meanwhile, President Zelensky met with British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak today, his last stop on a diplomatic tour of Europe, gaining new weapons and also support. ABC's Tom Sufi Burge is on the ground in Ukraine. Tonight, the most significant advance for Ukraine in six months. Dramatic drone video showing Ukrainian forces storming Russian positions near Bakhmut, taking land to the north and south. <sighs> Ukrainian troops lobbing grenades to clear trenches, capturing Russian soldiers. Today, President Zelensky suggesting the gains near Bakhmut are not the beginning of a major counteroffensive, saying on a trip to the UK his forces need a bit more time to prepare. The UK pledging more longer-range cruise missiles for Ukraine, as well as lethal attack drones. In the build-up to the Ukrainian offensive, we were shown this American mine-resistant infantry vehicle. When soldiers are inside one of these heavily armoured vehicles, they're protected from heavy explosions, and heavy machine gun fire. So when Ukraine is advancing, these vehicles will help save soldiers' lives. The U.S. supplying more than 500 of these to Ukraine. Our thanks to Tom for that. Now to a harrowing survivor's tale. A teenage girl who was celebrating the start of her school vacation was suddenly attacked by a shark. She fought off the shark, saving herself, and now she's telling her story. Here's ABC's Mona Kosar Abdi. A 13-year-old girl who courageously fought off a shark is recounting her harrowing encounter on a Florida beach. I was just in such shock that I tried, like, doing anything I could to get it off of me. Ella Reed telling ABC News that on Thursday, she was celebrating the first day of summer break with a friend at Fort Pierce Beach in shallow water when suddenly she felt a sharp pain. It was, like, about as big as me, I'd say. And I looked down and I saw it biting my stomach. And that's when I just like freaked out and did like everything I could to get it off me. Ella says she repeatedly punched what she believes was a five foot bull shark, but it was relentless. Once I got it off my stomach, it came back and bit my leg again. And then that's when I started running. Ella's mom rushing over to help. It was awful. It was panic. It was just surreal. And I felt like in a movie trying to get my kid to, to the hospital. The teen received 19 stitches. She had bite marks on her arm, finger, torso, and knee. Florida Atlantic University professor Stephen Kajura says it's unusual for sharks to approach shallow waters. And what was even more unusual was despite the fact that she brushed it off, it came back again a second time. In 2022, there were 16 cases of unprovoked shark attacks in Florida alone. Oh, Tiger shark! Tiger shark ran me. While this close encounter taking place off the coast of Kualoa in Hawaii Friday, oh! a kayaker nearly bitten, lucky to escape. The risks of being attacked extremely low. And a person is, you know, splashing around in the water and their hand will sort of catch the light and look like a little shiny fish. Professor Kajura says Ella did the right thing. Fight back. Poke it in the eyes, punch it in the gills, you know, smack it on the nose, whatever it takes to uh, fight back against the uh, shark and get it out of there. This brave teen now recovering. She's just unbelievable girl and um, I'm super proud of her. And um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> she's awesome. She's awesome. So brave. Our thanks to Mona for bringing us that story. Still much more to get to coming up. It has a major impact on so many of our lives, but we may not realize just how much. Writer Henry Grabar tells us why he believes parking explains the world. But next, a trail of destruction left by a deadly cyclone. Now the urgent need for help as communities try to rebuild. Whenever news breaks, to crush it. families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting when the nurses on the picket line. 
reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Bring them all. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Just the Game Show Show, Wednesday night. Life is like a game show. We all are looking for that jackpot. The chance to win $25,000, $100,000, a million dollars. Love it. What's better than that? When you give money out on a game show, oh, it's better than sex. Yes, yes. Finally, a show about game shows. You know, a lot of famous people have been on game shows. Wait, is that Meghan Markle? Just Welcome to the that. Game Show Show. Wednesday night on ABC. You're welcome. Reporting from the White House, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. The presidential election in Turkey is headed for a runoff for the first time in the country's history. The country's strongman leader Erdogan failed to secure the majority of votes needed in an election that has been seen as a referendum on his 20 years of rule. Turkey's Supreme Election Council scheduled a runoff vote for May 28th. To Serbia and a story that we're continuing to follow after two tragic and rare mass shootings in the country several weeks ago. Authorities there declared a one-month amnesty period for citizens to hand over fire firearms and they have indeed responded. Yesterday, authorities displayed more than 13,000 guns that have been handed over, half of which were not registered. Thousands have been pouring into the streets in recent days demanding gun reform and the removal of their populist leaders. Cyclone Mocha made landfall over the weekend, barreling into Myanmar, but mostly sparing Bangladesh, which initial forecast had predicted a direct hit. In Myanmar, several people were killed and about 1,000 people were in need of rescue after being trapped by up to 12 feet of seawater. 130 mile per hour winds left a trail of destruction in the western region of Myanmar. Residents there have begun the difficult task of rebuilding their homes and clearing their neighborhoods of debris. Human rights organizations in the region say thousands are now in need of shelter, food, and critical medical supplies. We've all felt the stress of looking for a parking spot, been outraged by the prices charged in parking garages, or panicked when we saw a parking ticket waiting on our windshield for us. Henry Gravar, a staff writer at Slate who covers housing, transportation, and urban policy, has a new book out called Paved Paradise, How Parking Explains the World, which dives into the often overlooked issue of parking. It's very much part of our everyday lives. Henry, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. All right, right off the top, people are gonna say, Why'd you write a book about parking? Why should it matter to us? Well, I'm a reporter, so I spent a lot of time looking into stories about housing, about transportation, about the environment, infrastructure, architecture, all these subjects. And it seemed to me that whatever the question, the answer was always parking, mm. which is to say, cars have obviously had an enormous effect on the American landscape. The car spends 95% of its time parked. There's more land used for parking in this country than there is for housing. Wow. And I read some reviews of the book that I want to just uh, showcase here. Parking is the primary determinant of the way the place you live looks, feels, and functions. And also this one, a parking space is nothing less than the link between driving and life itself. So in simple terms, explain why parking is so central to the lives of everyday Americans. Well, because we live in a country where almost all of us have to drive almost all of the time to get wherever we want to go. So when I say a parking spot is the link between driving and life itself. What I mean is you, you can't do whatever you set, you set out to do in the car until you can park. You can't get out of the car until you can find a parking space. So of course, 
parking functions as a kind of third rail in American politics. And you, you do have some funny little stories, anecdotes in there about a man who called 911 in Utah because he can't find a parking spot. A lady who lost 11 pounds because she didn't want to lose her parking spot, and so she walked everywhere. Instead, you also talk more seriously, though, about how there have been crimes and murders committed because of parking. How did we get here to that extreme? Well, again, we live in a place where most of us are dependent on parking. So to some extent, I'm not surprised that people have become so emotional mm. about this subject. Um, at the same time, you know, the degree to which we prioritize great parking, sometimes at the expense of everything else, means we've lost out on some other things that we also care about deeply as a society. Things like affordable housing, nice architecture, walkable neighborhoods. All of those things have been sacrificed to create enough parking. Explain to us the idea of parking minimums and how that determines who gets, uh, or, or I should say, which buildings get built and, and where. Sure. In most cities and suburbs in the United States, the city code requires that every building come with a certain number of parking spaces. So that means you want to open a restaurant, you are obligated to provide a certain number of parking spaces dependent on your square footage. You want to open, you want to build some housing, you have to provide a certain number of parking spaces. And the reason this is important is because parking, number one, takes up a lot of space, uh -huh. and number two, is very expensive to build. And so when you put these restrictions on builders in terms of what they could do with an existing property or an old building or something like that, you're putting a massive imposition on the types of results that we can get. Uh, in terms of the built environment, uh, and, and also just an enormous cost that's added on to everything we built. So what's the solution here? How do we solve all of this? Well, I think we could start by saying to builders, you can decide to build however much parking you want to build. You think that your tenants or your uh, clients or your uh, future, you know, the people who are buying your apartments, you think they want parking? Well, then you should build enough parking for them. But uh, what we've seen in the United States in places that have begun to reform these policies is that there are uh, builders who have decided that, in fact, many people would actually prefer to pay less in rent and figure out the parking situation oh. themselves. I talked to a developer in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is nobody's idea of a particularly walkable place, but nevertheless, he said, I could build the building with parking and it'll be $75 million, or I can build it without parking and it'll be $60 million, oh. and the rents will be $200 lower a month, and the tenants can figure out what they want to do with their cars themselves but at the very least, it's not going to be bundled into their rent. Do you think that there's a way that cities can be reimagined, perhaps, where we don't need this reliance on, on parking garages? One thing we've done is we've created a cycle where the more parking we build, the more people drive. And that's both because it functions as a subsidy for driving. If you buy a house and it was required to include a two-car garage, you've made essentially a down payment on, on car ownership and, in fact, a down payment on owning two cars. Uh, so that, that's an incentive for driving. And the other one is that when we build all this parking, we create an environment where it's really hard to walk around or bike or it just feels unsafe and dangerous. And, and so uh, there is also a virtuous cycle that can be unlocked. If you create places where parking is deprioritized, where the parking lot is behind the building instead of in front of it, where there's slightly, slightly less room for parking and slightly more room for buildings and for people, people are going to want to walk. I never knew parking was so interesting. <laughs> Henry Grubar, we thank you so much for talking with us and being here. Your new book, Pave Paradise, How Parking Explains the World, is now available wherever books are sold. And still to come, we've all seen our fair share of game shows, but what makes them so popular? We take a look into the science behind the scenes. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every story. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television.
right now in America with so much at stake. Thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Me and my friends started holding hands and we all started to pray. This is one of the most powerful stories I have ever covered. The unthinkable. When I saw him run out, I thought I had lost him. Sadly, after tragedies like this, the world moves on. Well, not this time. <laughs> oh my God. I didn't want another mom to feel this way. You were so funny. This is one special you will never forget. I certainly won't. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. It's a tale as old as broadcast television. Game shows have been around since the 1940s and have been an American primetime classic. But what makes these quiz shows so compelling? Turns out there's a science to it. ABC's Morgan Norwood explains. This is Jeopardy! From the reverse Q&A of Jeopardy! to the hangman puzzle of Wheel of Fortune. No D. Game shows have a hold on American television and its viewers, but why? Kenneth Sumner, professor of psychology at Montclair State University, says it comes down to connection. I think one of the biggest reasons is that the contestants on the game shows are very much like us in the audience. They look like us, they sound like us, they know the same kinds of things as us, so I think we can identify with them actually quite well. And once we're connected, we crave competition. A lot of game shows are actually structured that way to get you more excited and motivated to see a great finish to a game or see someone do something particularly well. And that great finish coupled with that grand prize tends to make us fantasize. What would I do with that money to make my life better or my loved one's lives better? It's something about the dream of it that gets people excited about game shows. Bottom line, Game shows feed our hunger for connection, competition, and camaraderie. A lot of these things have lasted for generations and generations because they are interesting and they are compelling to people. The rules are relatively simple, but it is a, a great way to kind of just relax and enjoy the game and relax and enjoy the people around you. Still enjoyed so many years later. Our thanks to Morgan for that. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. Have a great night. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot without ever having a chance to share my side of the story. Aaron Carter's life story in one sentence. The drugs, the drinking, everything goes back to tragedy. I just know I've turned it around and I've got a lot to say. There's always two sides to every story. So much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! Is this mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. 
America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're gonna take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, the country marred by yet another mass shooting. Be advised, I got several people down. I've got three vehicles that are, uh, I got three people that are dead as well. At least three are dead and more wounded, including two police officers in a shooting that has rocked the town of Farmington, New Mexico. The details up ahead. Plus, I wanted to kill his ass. I know. Sorry to say it like that. I did too. We got to do something to this man for all the pain. I mean, not only just with my, I, I mean, like I lost my friends too. Roberto was one of my best friends. Mark is one of my best friends. I mean, these are people I see every day. Healing from hate, one year after the Buffalo Massacre, we're chronicling a community's quest to save itself. That's in tonight's prime focus. And I don't think that my idea of success or my goals or my ambitions have ever been tied to numbers. I think that the person who really wins is the person that does whatever they want to do every day and really is happy. Kali Uchis is a breakout star enchanting fans in both English as well as Spanish. And we joined her as she took to the stage in one of the most renowned theaters in the world. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including the investigation that's now underway after a man armed with a metallic baseball bat entered a congressional office and beat at least two staffers. Plus, why one particular COVID vaccine is no longer available nationwide and what that means for those who took it. If you find yourself wondering if you're spending more time than ever on email and in meetings, you are certainly not alone. The new study that points to just how much time is being spent and an encounter for the ages. What happened when a kayaker, oh, you see it right there, and a shark came face to face? Our correspondents are fanned out across the country, covering those stories and much more for us tonight. But we do begin with yet another mass shooting in America, and it comes just one year after the massacre that left 10 dead after a racially motivated mass shooting in Buffalo, New York. We take you back to that community, which is still trying to rebuild one year later. But first, the cycle of gun violence only exacerbated today by what happened in Farmington, New Mexico. At least three people have died and two officers were injured after confronting and killing the gunman. A call all about an active shooter went out around 11 a.m. local time. Nearby homes and cars were reportedly struck by gunfire during the confrontation in this residential neighborhood, while local schools were placed on lockdown for two hours. According to the Gun Violence Archive, this marks the 225th mass shooting in the U.S. so far this year. Authorities are still searching for a possible motive at this hour. ABC's Kana Whitworth leads us off. Tonight, the urgent investigation into a mass shooting in Farmington, New Mexico, that left at least three people dead, two police officers wounded, and seven other people injured. Police say the 18-year-old alleged gunman seen here pacing outside of a church wearing all black and holding a gun was also killed. There's multiple shots still going off in the background on our open lines. Authorities from multiple agencies responding to reports of an active shooter northwest of Albuquerque around 11 a.m. Officers responded to the area to find a chaotic scene where a male subject was actively firing upon individuals in that neighborhood. Be advised, I got several people down. Schools citywide put on lockdown as police search for the shooter. I have eyes on the suspect. He's walking south. Officers confronting and killing the suspect. The two injured officers now in stable condition at the hospital. Multiple homes and vehicles reportedly hit by gunfire. Witnesses describing the whore. I'm in my garage and I hear this rap, 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 rap. So far this year, there have been at least 225 mass shootings in the United States, according to the Gun Violence Archive. That number just continues to surge. Kana Whitworth joins us now. Kana, you just learned more information about the injured and also the gunman? Right, so just moments ago, Lindsay, authorities saying that in addition to those two officers that were injured, seven other people were also injured. Authorities also saying that this suspect, which they believe is the only suspect here, is 18 years old. Also, all the schools that were on lockdown are now open. That lockdown has been lifted. But also, Lindsay, the FBI says they are standing by. They are ready to assist here if need be. 
The suspect just 18 years old. Kena Whitworth, our thanks to you. Now to the other big story playing out tonight after a man carried out a violent attack at the office of Virginia Congressman Jerry Connolly. The assailant showed up with a metal baseball bat, asked for the congressman, and then assaulted two of Connolly's staff members as others ran to hide. One of the two staffers, an intern marking her first day on the job. It's all part of an alarming trend of violence on the nation's elected officials, with threats against lawmakers now increasing 400% in just the last six years. Janae Norman has more on this attack. Tonight, the targeted attack at a congressman's office. You could absolutely tell that the people inside were scared. They were hiding. Two staffers for Virginia Democratic Representative Jerry Connolly rushed to the hospital after police say a man walked into his Fairfax, Virginia district office and attacked them with a metal baseball bat. Someone swinging a bat around, I mean, I would be scared as well. The alleged attacker, identified as 49-year-old Schwan Katron Pham, Connolly's office, telling ABC News he hit a senior aide in the head and an intern in the upper body. Police say the suspect asked for the congressman by name, but Connolly was at a ribbon cutting for a food bank in his district at the time. What is it you're trying to protect? Connolly, a Democrat who serves on the House Foreign Affairs and House Oversight Committees, writing, my district office staff make themselves available to constituents and members of the public every day. The thought that someone would take advantage of my staff's accessibility to commit an act of violence is unconscionable and devastating. Well, indeed, tonight there is no word on a motive, but authorities say they are looking into mental illness as a potential factor. And as for that intern who was injured, Lindsay, we're told it was their first day on the job. Just unbelievable. Janae, our thanks to you. Next tonight, the final report of the special counsel investigating the origins of the FBI's probe into the Trump campaign's possible ties to Russia. After a four-year investigation, finding the FBI never should have launched the Trump-Russia probe in the first place. Here's ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas. Tonight, the end of a long road for special counsel John Durham, who was appointed by Donald Trump's Attorney General Bill Barr four years ago to dig into the origins of the FBI's Russia investigation into Trump and his campaign. The Biden administration left Durham in place to complete his work, and in his final report, he slams the FBI, indicating they never should have launched a probe in the first place, since neither U.S. law enforcement nor the intelligence community appears to have possessed any actual evidence of collusion. Instead, Durham found that the Bureau relied on raw, unanalyzed, and uncorroborated intelligence, noting that there was significant reliance on investigative leads provided or funded directly or indirectly by Trump's political opponents. An example, the so-called Steele dossier of allegations prepared by former British spy Christopher Steele. Durham found the FBI was unable to corroborate a single substantive allegation from the dossier. But Trump's own comments about Russia in the campaign added to questions about possible collusion. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. Durham found the FBI failed to critically analyze information that ran counter to the narrative of a Trump-Russia collusive relationship, calling that extremely troublesome. But Durham's investigation, which cost taxpayers $6.5 million, falls far short of proving there was a deep state conspiracy against Trump. The special counsel brought no charges against any senior intelligence or law enforcement officials. And the two major cases he did pursue both ended in acquittals. Durham only convicted one lower level FBI official of misconduct in pursuing an electronic surveillance warrant. Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, has the FBI responded to the special counsel's report? Well, Lindsay, the special counsel's blistering assessment of the FBI tracks closely with a 2019 highly critical report from the DOJ Inspector General. Tonight, the FBI says it already has put in place dozens of corrective actions that might have prevented those mistakes that were made. Lindsay. Pierre Thomas, our thanks to you. And staying in Washington now, where time is running out on the debt ceiling standoff that could have a global ripple effect. President Biden and congressional leaders are set to meet tomorrow before the president leaves for a G7 summit on Wednesday. The president is expressing some optimism, but House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says they're still far apart in talks. ABC's senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest. Tonight, with time running out, President Biden is summoning top congressional leaders back to the White House. What day? Tomorrow. 
Over the weekend, the president insisting progress has been made. I really think there's a desire on their part as well as ours to reach agreement. I think we'll be able to do it. But today, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy tells me they are nowhere near a deal. It's just staff moving ideas back and forth, but there's no movement. Are you confident like that it'll happen by the end of the week, Speaker McCarthy? Not based upon what they're offering right now, no. McCarthy says he will not raise the debt limit unless the president agrees to spending cuts. Sources say on the table, clawing back unspent COVID funds, streamlining regulations for new energy projects, and imposing stricter work requirements for certain federal aid programs. The consequences of a default would be dire. Social security payments would halt. Troops could go unpaid. And by one projection, nearly 8 million people could lose their jobs. Default is not an option. Its consequences are too damaging, too severe. It must, must be taken off the table. Both sides seemingly trying to avert a potential crisis. Rachel Scott joins us now from Capitol Hill. Rachel, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen once again sounding the alarm on the potential deadline for default. What's her latest warning? Well, Lindsay, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is making it clear that even waiting into the last minute to raise the debt limit could disrupt financial markets and could also downgrade the credit rating for the United States. The closer that we get to default, the worse all of this gets, which is why tonight she is urging Congress to move quickly, Lindsay. Rachel Scott, our thanks to you as always. To the border, after Title 42 expired Thursday night and new rules kicked in, Biden administration officials say the expected surge didn't happen and that the number of people seeking entry has been cut in half. But thousands have gathered on the Mexican side of the border and many more are on the way. ABC's Will Carr is at a processing center in Brownsville, Texas. Tonight, a significant drop in encounters at the border from over 10,000 per day just before Title 42 expired to around 4,200 on Saturday. New rules require non-Mexican migrants to have been denied asylum in another country or apply for an interview through an app. If they don't, they could be deported and barred from entering the U.S. for five years. The message that there are consequences in place at the border is an important one that we hope is resonating. In cities at the border and around the country are already at a breaking point. New York City receiving hundreds of asylum seekers every day, more than 4,200 last week alone, reopening the iconic Roosevelt Hotel as an arrival center. I crossed into Mexico to see the conditions at a massive border camp with more than 1,500 migrants in Matamoros. There are quite literally piles of garbage here. You can smell it. There's smoke in the air. They're burning. They're cooking. They're doing everything they can to uh, try to sustain themselves. Many migrants tell me they're trying to use the CBP app, but have run into glitches or are having trouble with service. Still, this woman fleeing violence from Honduras, walking the majority of the way to the border, says she's willing to wait. Will Carr joins us. Now, Will, what are authorities saying about the number of migrants trying to cross the border? Lindsay, federal authorities say there's been a 50% drop over the last three days. They say hundreds of migrants have been turned back to Mexico and thousands more are in custody going through asylum interviews right now. They say that if there still is a surge, they'll be ready in the coming days and weeks. Lindsay. All right, Will Carforce. Thanks so much, Will. Ukraine's deputy defense minister says Ukrainian soldiers continue to gain ground in the battle for Bakhmut. Meanwhile, President Zelensky met with British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak today, his last stop on a diplomatic tour of Europe, gaining new weapons and support. ABC's Tom Sufi Burridge is on the ground for us in Ukraine. Tonight, the most significant advance for Ukraine in six months. Dramatic drone video showing Ukrainian forces storming Russian positions near Bakhmut, taking land to the north and south. <sighs> Ukrainian troops lobbing grenades to clear trenches, capturing Russian soldiers. Today, President Zelensky suggesting the gains near Bakhmut are not the beginning of a major counteroffensive, saying on a trip to the UK, his forces need a bit more time to prepare. The UK pledging more longer-range cruise missiles for Ukraine, as well as lethal attack drones. In the build-up to the Ukrainian offensive, we were shown this American mine-resistant infantry vehicle. When soldiers are inside one of these heavily armoured vehicles, they're protected from heavy explosions, and heavy machine gun fire. So when Ukraine is advancing, these vehicles will help save soldiers' lives. The U.S. supplying more than 500 of these to Ukraine. 
And tonight, the White House saying Russia and Iran are expanding their, quote, unprecedented defence partnership, with Moscow looking to buy more of those lethal Iranian drones to attack Ukrainian cities. Lindsay? Tom, thank you. Another horse has died after a race at Churchill Downs, making it the eighth fatality in recent weeks at the home of the Kentucky Derby. The three-year-old Colt Rio Moon was euthanized after suffering a catastrophic injury to his left foreleg a few strides after the wire. Two horses were euthanized after being injured in other races on the same weekend as the Kentucky Derby. Five others were euthanized after training and racing incidents at the track in the days leading up to the Derby. The seven initial deaths are being investigated as a triple crown shifts to the Preakness this week. Weekend. The COVID-19 vaccine from Johnson & Johnson is no longer available in the United States. That's according to the Centers for Disease Control. All remaining doses expired last week, and the CDC directed providers to dispose of any that they had left. Only 19 million people in the U.S. received the J&J &J vaccine since it first became available, compared to more than 230 million doses of the original Moderna vaccine and more than 360 million doses of the original Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Now to the news on the case of the Colorado mom, Suzanne Morphew, who vanished on Mother's Day three years ago with her husband Barry making a tearful plea for her return. He was later charged with her murder, but days before the trial, prosecutors dropped the charges. Now tonight, Barry Morphew is suing for $15 million. ABC's Ariel Reshev has an exclusive interview with him and his daughters. Tonight, an ABC News exclusive. Barry Morphew, the man accused of killing his wife, Suzanne, after she disappeared on Mother's Day in 2020, speaking only to ABC after first-degree murder and tampering with evidence charges were dropped against him. Barry and their daughters, Macy and Mallory, say his life has been ruined by false accusations. What have these last three years been like for you? Very, very sad. Very confusing. Just so traumatic. Like, literally, our worst nightmare. <laughs> Did you have anything to do with the disappearance of your wife? <laughs> Absolutely not. Barry filing a $15 million civil suit against prosecutors, the sheriff, and several investigators. So I know that $15 million is a huge number, but I don't think that, in my mind, that covers any of the damage that's happened to Barry and the girls. If they would just look for Suzanne outside of where they hypothesize Barry could have possibly buried her remains, they could find her. Prosecutors say they dropped the charges, hoping for additional evidence, believing they were close to finding Suzanne's body. Prosecutors say Suzanne was having an affair, preparing to leave Barry after he found out and disappeared shortly after texting Barry, I'm done. What was your first thought? My heart was broke. My heart was broken. I didn't believe it. And the DAs believed that they had their guy. And they believe that there's a mountain of evidence against you. There's just not Suzanne's body. They're wrong. They're, they've got tunnel vision. And they looked at one person and they've got too much pride to say they're wrong and look somewhere else. Lindsay, the Chafee County Sheriff's Office and the DA saying that they cannot comment on pending litigation or ongoing investigations. Authorities say that Barry Morphew is still a suspect in his wife's disappearance and they're not ruling out future charges. Lindsay. Ariel, thank you. After a contentious election back in February, the new mayor of Chicago was sworn in today. Brandon Johnson was sworn in as the city's 57th mayor Monday, kicking off what he has promised will be four years of reform, progress, and history making. Johnson is stepping up amid multiple complex challenges facing the city, chief among them being an anticipated spike in violence this upcoming summer and a burgeoning crisis of asylum seekers being sent to Chicago from Texas and Colorado. Those will likely be Johnson's first test as mayor as he addressed both in his inaugural remarks. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, a man captures the terrifying moment. A shark jumps out of the water and attacks his kayak. Plus, Martha Stewart makes history gracing a different type of magazine cover. But next, in our Prime Focus, moving forward, one year after a tragedy left 10 people killed in a hate-fueled attack, how some Buffalo residents are helping the community heal. We're here at 238 Carlton, the future site of the African Heritage Food Cooperative grocery store. We're very, very happy to be able to provide healthy options for folks within walking distance in 
a site that's been victimized by food apartheid.